Why, Brink, hello. Hi, Dan. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. How are welcome you? To your fir- All right, welcome to your first blogging heads. Well, it's very exciting. Thanks for ushering me into this brave new world. No problem, although I'm a, I'm a little upset having read the papers today discovering that, you know, potentially naps are good for you would write about now. I, I think I might have to lobby blogging heads for some sort of, you know, napping subsidy or something. I'm a little concerned about the health effects of this. Uh, absolutely, particularly... Uh, Given the horrible, stressful situation I'm in right now, in the middle of uh, a, a DC winter storm panic. Uh, oh, yeah, the DC winter storm panic is it? You know, it's a time-honored uh, ritual. I, the, the year that I spent there, I remember that. You know, you'd have so many times it'd be big storm coming, big storm coming, big storm coming. You get maybe a half inch of snow, which of course would cause actual people who hadn't grown up in the Northeast to panic. Um, no, it's but. It's, 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 Total, unadulterated, unabated, imbecilic hysteria. And the, <laughs> and the grocery stores are filled with people getting their bottled water and their duct tape and their Cipro, so it's, uh, it's an exciting time, and, but a stressful time, so we could use a nap maybe after we're done. That's true. And, you know, that's so unusual from normal D.C. culture, too, the, the panicking and all that. So, yeah, that's right. Uh, that's very good. Um, well, all right, why don't we uh, start with our... Uh, um, you wrote an essay a couple months ago about... Uh, in the wake of the 2006 midterms, about uh, which got quickly dubbed liberalitarians, the idea that uh, that economic libertarians could fuse with social libertarians um, within the Democratic Party, whereas historically you had sort of Frank Myers fusionism that had paired economic uh, libertarians with social conservatives. Um, and Brink, I have one question to ask you: Where is your libertarian god now? <laughs> well, he's uh, he's in hiding, just as the the libertarian god was in hiding beforehand. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I wrote this piece uh, in recognition of the of the deep problems with the the traditional conservative fusionist alliance uh, between traditionalists and or social conservatives and libertarians. Uh, that has always been uh, a philosophically uh, dicey mixture, uh, but it worked politically uh, for uh, a long time, and it's, it's worked off and on over the years. It may, it may work again in the future, but it, it hasn't been working very well of late. And uh, with uh, the Bush administration and the Republican Congress's uh, uh, conversion to big government conservatism, uh, so uh, given very deep-seated libertarian dissatisfaction with what the right is doing, uh, it seems at least uh, prudent to check out and see what the other half of the political spectrum is doing. There is Libertarians have, have always considered themselves neither of the left nor the right. Uh, that right. is, uh, they, uh, they find themselves in company with the right on economics issues and in company with the left on social and personal liberty and civil liberties issues. Uh, but as a matter of practical politics, libertarian-minded uh, voters have tended to side uh, with the conservatives and the Republicans uh, because their concern with economics issues, tax spending regulation issues, uh, uh, trumped their worries about what the right would do on the social front. Uh, but with the right's abandonment of any kind of uh, any kind of uh, commitment to small government conservatism. Whatsoever. Uh, yeah. Whatsoever. Uh, runaway spending, uh, expansion of the entitlement state, federal takeover of education policy, uh, plus a whole raft of horrors on, on the civil liberties and executive power side. Uh, mm-hmm. Then suddenly uh, the Democrats don't look so, bu- so bad. Uh, and we have common ground. Uh, libertarian folks have common ground with Democrats on uh, on immigration, on uh, the uh, sort of joint opposition to the anti-gay marriage hysteria and the federal marriage right. amendment, mm-hmm. uh, concern about the Patriot Act and executive power overreaching in the post-9/11 world. So there's a there's a bunch of uh, currently existing common ground. What I tried to explore in this article was whether the real and uh, and deep differences between liberals and libertarians on economics issues might be uh, might be compromised. Whether there's something in the middle uh, uh, between uh, the libertarian concern for controlling the size of government and uh, protecting free markets and free exchange, 
uh, and the liberal concern for uh, or the <clears throat> liberal concern for egalitarian uh, reforms. If there's right. any way to come up with a, a win-win batch of policies that both of us could live with, both of us would consider uh, superior to the status quo. I mean, you know, my t I, I blog about this when you when you first wrote it. This caused caused quite a ripple. Um, I mean, I had a couple thoughts at the time. The first was was that it wasn't clear to me. You know, although the, I mean, I know Cato, for example, argues that there was a you know, the libertarian vote numbers what uh, 12 percent, 13 percent of, uh, of oh, voters well, from the 2006 election or from so, previous elections. Something like that. Yeah, um, you know, which makes them potentially an influential block. Except it's not clear how cohesive that block is, and obviously, the problem I had with the you know, I mean, I, the problem I had with with the empirical analysis was that, you know, 2006 was an election where economic populists won the day. Uh, by and large on the Democratic side and to a lesser extent on the Republican side. So it's not clear to me that you can actually have, you know, the, the, anything more than just a tactical marriage of convenience. And even then, I'm not sure it's a tactical marriage. I mean, part of the reason it struck me that, that fusionism worked on the Republican side, particularly during the Reagan years, is because Reagan was willing, you know, because at that point the social conservatives were perfectly happy if Reagan just talked the talk. He didn't have to do anything more than right. that, necessarily. Um, you know, there was obviously business on court appointments. There were a few other sort of feints in that direction. But let's face it, on the whole, you know, the Reagan administration was not terribly, you know, the, there was the Mexico City policy. But, but, you know, beyond a few sort of symbolic markers, there wasn't a huge increase in social conservatism. And social conservatives are, are no longer satisfied with just that sort of uh, situation. My fear is that if libertarians were to fuse, you know, or try to, to move for the libertarian uh, instinct, you know, particularly because they'd be the newcomers to the Democratic Party, at least the economic ones, wouldn't we just sort of see a replay where the Democrats would just sort of make, you know, the occasional feint towards economic libertarianism, but in point of fact just act in a populist manner? Uh, that's entirely possible. Uh, it, of course, depends on what the Republicans do as well. Uh, if you're a swing constituency, as libertarians hope to become, uh, right. you, you can only swing uh, in, uh, <clears throat> if, if the other two sides are, are courting you or, or actively repelling you, one or the other. Well, going back to what you said about the, the libertarian block of voters, I, I agree wholeheartedly that uh, it is not a cohesive or well-defined block. It's a completely incoherent and, and vague and ill-defined and unself-conscious block. Uh, our ideological categories are... And we're terribly hard to organize, let's face it, you know? I mean, it's, it's almost, you know, part of our nature. You, you know, organizing libertarians is like herding cats. No, that's, that's right, but it's, it's beyond that. It's uh, our linear political left-right spectrum has room for liberals and conservatives. Those are the ideological categories. Those are how people define themselves. Uh, libertarian isn't a category that is, uh, that is widely understood or used in, in modern political discourse, and so uh, it's... Uh, it's uh, right now, what we're talking about are people who classify themselves as conservatives or classify themselves as liberals or classify themselves as independents and moderates, but who, in response to pollsters, show attitudes that are uh, economically conservative and socially liberal uh, to some degree of rigor. Uh, okay. but, but they haven't been whipped into any kind of cohesive electoral block because our, uh, our politics doesn't pay attention to them. And, and so that really is is at the root of, uh, of what I was trying to say in this New Republic article. Uh, that, that article contained first a diagnosis and second a prescription. The libertarian alliance was the prescription, and, and I think that's a speculative one, and whether it pans out or not, who knows. The mm -hmm. diagnosis I'm, I'm much more comfortable uh, about and much more confident yeah. in, and that is that our current politics, our current ideologies of life, left and right, uh, have become dysfunctional. Uh, that is, uh, that the the uh, the core of the ideology of the left and the core of the ideology of the right have now become fundamentally reactionary, uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, that is their spending their main energy is is expended on crying over spilt milk. Uh, the uh, the right can't get over the fact that the 60s happened and and brought in its wake uh, a whole bunch of uh, irrevocable cultural changes. Uh, the left can't get over the fact that the 80s happened uh, and brought in its wake uh, a whole host of irrevocable economic changes. And so, as I said in the article, you have this strange spectacle of both the left and the right pining for the 1950s. Uh, the, 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 
the left wants to work there, the right wants to go home there. Uh, but, right. uh, but there aren't any time machines. We can't go back. Uh, we have had uh, a great deal of cultural change uh, as a result of the convulsions of the 60s and 70s, much of it good, some of it horrible. Uh, we've had a great deal of economic change uh, in, as a result of the economic restructuring of the 70s and 80s, uh, a lot of it good, some of it horrible. Uh, but we're not going back. And our politics is currently organized around discontents with the way things are, with the way American society has, uh, has, has developed and, and where it's headed, I would argue that, that over the past generation, American society has, has become significantly more libertarian. On the cultural side, it's become much more socially liberal. Uh, and on the economic side, the economy has become much more competitive, more entrepreneurial, more globalized, uh, uh, more libertarian friendly. Uh, and yet uh, our ideological categories are, are, are both fundamentally dissatisfied with this state of affairs. So my idea is that if some kind of politics could come along that was actually uh, comfortable with and embraced uh, the changes that have, uh, that have swept through American society over the past 30 or 40 years, uh, then that, would, that politics would then be swimming with the tide. It wouldn't be reactionary, and it, and it should be able to command the center of American politics. Whether it happens well, from a, a Democrat who is playing to uh, uh, more egalitarian concerns or whether it, uh, it, uh, it comes from a Republican who's playing to more socially conservative concerns, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, but it seems to me that until, until something like that happens, we're stuck in this kind of nasty politics where, uh, where we have a lot of empty symbolism. We've got gay marriage and... Terry Schiavo on the right, and we've got Walmart bashing and, and uh, obsessing about how the top 1% are doing over on the left, and, but nobody really capable of advocating policies that accomplish anything because what they really want is to go back in time. Yeah, I, mean, I, think, I, I mean, I have two re responses to this. The first is, as a libertarian, I would, I would like to think that you're correct. I would like to think that you know, an intellectual movement that embraced the, the you know, dynamic changes that have taken place both socially and economically over the last couple of decades, would, as you point out, swim with the tide and potentially attract voters. The problem is, is that as a political scientist, my instinct says that there are two kinds of, of middles you can pursue. The first one is the kind of libertarian one that you're talking about that embraces economic uh, liberalism and social liberalism. The problem is, is that I actually see politics moving in the exact opposite direction. You can argue that a, that a, you know, that a politician that embraces both social conservatism and economic populism is equally in the middle um, yes. because it, it's, you know, attracting uh, elements from, from both sides, as it were. Um, and it seems, you know, just as an empirical matter, that those kind of views resonate much more with Americans at this point than the kind of libertarian views you're talking about. Even if you can demonstrate empirically that society is better off for the whole variety of, of sort of dynamic changes that have taken place because of the way the free market works, because of sort of cultural liberalization, um, it is much easier to sell the past than it is the future. It's much easier to sell, you know, to, to, to hammer away at issues about insecurity rather than things like, you know, expanding opportunity. So the problem I've got is that even though I'm intellectually sympathetic to your argument, politically, I mean, take a look, you know, we, we need to talk about this also, you know, that you're seeing this raging debate about the growth of inequality and whether or not it's a good or bad thing, which is a topic that libertarians don't generally like to talk about. Yeah, I, I agree with you uh, that there is that certainly populist candidates uh, or economic populist candidates did well uh, in the 06 election. We can talk about that. Uh, and, and there will always be an appetite for and an audience for reactionary politics. There's always going to be people who are uh, upset about change and who are feel dislocated or threatened by change, and those people will always respond to, to, to politicians that are railing against the direction of change. Um, so that's always going to be with us. Uh, I think it doesn't work very well on the national level, uh, and so we, <clears throat> you will always have regions of the country that are being hard hit and, and therefore will be receptive to an economic populist message. Um, like and the you'll, Belt, and you'll have right exactly, uh, and you'll have regions of the country that are culturally conservative, and therefore, uh, you know, the, they respond to uh, to social conservative messages or, or what we might call reactionary messages. Uh, but I would say the big problem with with uh, with with a politics that looks for the center uh, in a in a with populism. 
uh, is that it, it will inevitably lead to frustration. Although people's sentiments may be there, that's not where society is, that's not where the direction of social change is, and therefore you can't deliver on your promises. You can rail against Walmart, you can rail against outsourcing, uh, and then when you get in office, what are you going to do about it? Nothing. Uh, we had John Kerry in 04 uh, during the whole outsourcing uh, kerfuffle, uh, playing, oh, to yeah. that, playing to that kind of reactionary sentiment, railing against B Benedict Arnold CEOs. Uh, but then, okay, well, what are you going to do about uh, outsourcing? And he, he prescribed, you know, a couple of fiddles with the tax code. So it was like he was screaming bubonic plague and... and, and prescribing a couple of Advils. Likewise, you have conservatives now for 20 years have been screaming about the, the uh, decadence and, and slouching towards Gomorrah and cultural decline, and when they get in office, what can they do about it? Not much of anything, uh, because they're, they're trying to sweep back the tide. So right. I, I think uh, in the short term, uh, you, can, you can win with a populist message, you can win with a reactionary message, uh, but you can reach a period where people are frustrated with that kind of politics because it's clear it doesn't really pan out in, in terms of action on the ground. I, I have some uh, hope uh, that we're nearing that level of frustration right now, that people are sick of Team Red demonizing Team Blue and vice versa, and, uh, and that perhaps we might uh, be receptive to someone who plays to our, uh, to our hopes and opportunities rather than to our fears. But, but isn't uh, that? I mean, when you but, argue but that's the, right the Barack, yeah, I mean that's the, I mean that's the Barack Obama strategy to some extent. Um, you know, I mean this is one of the things that Obama has sort of emphasized since he announced, which is I don't want to get into this sort of. I mean, he, he doesn't talk about it in terms of ideas. He talks about it in terms of partisanship. But surely, I think Obama thinks one of his selling points is that precisely because he wasn't associated with either the partisanship of the '90s or you know, the Iraq debate of 2002, which is, by the way, another example of how even foreign policy is now sort of almost foreign policy debates are retrospective yes. uh, as much as they are about the future. Um, you know, but the problem is I'm not sure Obama is really someone a libertarian to be terribly friendly with. No, there's, there's a style versus substance issue here. I think for 15 years we've seen a, a hunger for getting past left versus right, and we've seen right. people from Ross Perot to... Uh, at the state level, uh, uh, Jesse Ventura and, uh, and Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, to McCain in 2000, people who seemed to, to transcend the partisan uh, left-right divide. Mm -hmm. But they didn't, they didn't really have a substantive message that, that made coherent sense out of that position, and so they, they've all been uh, flashes in the pan. What you need is some kind of actual body of worked out ideas and a program uh, that will that will marry substance to that nonpartisan trans ideological style. Uh, I uh, I put my bid down for what such substance would look like. I hope other people will be thinking along similar lines, and we'll see where we go. But I, I agree. Right now, uh, amongst Democrats, uh, the populists are in the saddle, and uh, and concern with inequality and insecurity uh, seems to trump. Uh, uh, interest in how to maximize growth and opportunity. I mean, just to close on this point, I mean, it's interesting that the collection of people you talked about, Ventura, Perot, Schwarzenegger, and, uh, you know, I think Obama would potentially count in that, right. which is what, what drove all of those things, you're right, there was no coherent set of ideas. It was more the idea that they were both, A, charismatic, and, B, everyone was so disgusted with the status quo in whatever situation it was that, that any, you know, that, that a charismatic alternative seemed as an attraction, which... I'd say from a Weberian sense might disturb me because generally the charismatics were often thought to be the lower form of, of government. But then again, there's a difference between politics and bureaucracy. So right. um, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm, I've read too much of my Weber to, uh, to comment on that. No, I, but, think, I think when the ideological categories are broken and those are things that people have confidence in, and they're, uh, uh, then, then what do you appeal to? You just appeal to personality. That, yeah. can, that can be something that brings people together if, if ideology isn't working anymore. And so I, I think we have seen that. And, and so uh, uh, to me, these are all symptoms of a, of a problem with, with the way our politics is working right now and, and whether or not some political or policy entrepreneurs can come up, can, can fill this vacuum uh, remains to be seen. Well, speaking of the sort of public anxiety, um, I mean, the, the sort of issue du jour for the last, I'd say, six months or so among economists in the blogosphere and also, you know, uh, you guys at Cato are sponsoring something on this, is the growth of in economic inequality or the perceived growth of economic inequality and whether or not it's an issue and whether or not it's as, as uh, widespread as some people 
you know, believe it to be. I think you've got a, an open forum right now that Alan, where Alan Reynolds is defending his argument that uh, inequality concerns have been overstated. Would right. We have, a, we have a, a, a web magazine at Cato, Cato Unbound, uh, right. at which uh, this month's issue is on the inequality wars. And we have Alan Reynolds, who caused a stir with a with the Wall Street Journal op-ed back in December saying that uh, he didn't see much in the way of evidence of, of any kind of significant sustained increase in income inequality since the late 1980s. Uh, he was uh, pounced upon and torn to shreds uh, by uh, uh, all the right-thinking sorts of the blogosphere, and, uh, and so we've arranged a forum where we've got hostiles and friendlies duking it out with him uh, this month to, to get to the bottom of it. And, and I don't know if they'll get to the bottom of it or not, because it is uh, the, the inequality statistical food fight is, is, uh, is – uh, an, an amazingly Dance. nasty affair and, and a no. very difficult one to get to the bottom of because there are so many different dimensions of inequality and so many different ways to measure it that right. just making a blanket statement, inequality is up. Do you mean income inequality? Do you mean consumption, consumption inequality? inequality? Do you mean wealth, wealth inequality? Do you mean 90-10 uh, inequality or 90-50 inequality? Uh, right. Or do you mean Gini inefficient inequality? Uh, do you, what base years are you looking at? Are you controlling for changes in household size? Are you controlling for changes in, in demography with the big immigration wave? Uh, so, uh, you know, once you get to, once you sort through all of that, uh, the way you sort through it often depends on your priors, I'm afraid. Uh, and so uh, people who have an ideological commitment to, uh, to thinking ill of our more competitive, more entrepreneurial, more globalized economy are going to be tempted to read inequality in a way where things are looking worse and worse. And so this economy is failing us uh, because it is failing to, to measure up to some sense of social justice. And people who uh, are ideologically committed to being in favor of this new, more freer, uh, uh, new, freer and more competitive economy are, are likely to look at the, the numbers and say, I don't see a problem. Um, so getting past people's priors and actually digging out uh, an objective, empirical uh, truth on this is, is hard work. Well, as you said, part of the problem is, is that, you know, it's, you can have multiple objective truths. Um, yes. And, I mean, and that's what, that's what you see. In, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Let me, let, me, let me say a few stylized facts, and then you can correct me, because this is not, you know, exactly my area of expertise, but, you know, I'm sort of a, a consumer of it. The perception I have is that, you know, inequality is increased if you measure it by income. If you yes. measure it by consumption, it's not nearly as stark. That's right. Um, and in terms of wealth, it's not also it's also not completely clear to me because it sort of depends on when people had their assets or when people own their assets. I, I would, I'm not completely sure about the wealth inequality. Um, and, yeah, I, and also, I don't, the, think there, I don't think there's been a big dramatic change in wealth inequality in the, in, in recent years or the last couple of decades. Right. Although, correct me if I'm wrong, Peter Galbraith, for example, I think has argued that in fact. A lot of the rise in income inequality, even over the decade of the 90s, was due to, um, you know, entrepreneurial activity in something like five zip codes or something like that, where, you know, it was just they did well in, you know, places like Silicon Valley and so on and so forth. And that's actually driving a lot of this. Um, yeah, so there's, there's big fortunes at the top uh, that can right. skew things. Uh, and there's also huge uh, sort of compositional effects, that is, apples to oranges comparisons uh, that you have yeah. to control for if you're going to try to figure out uh, whether, in fact, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, uh, or at least relatively, if not absolutely. Uh, in, in particular, uh, we tend to measure income inequality in, in terms of household income, uh, but households today are much smaller than they were in the 70s because of divorce and just more people living alone. Uh, right. So that's a big deal. Uh, yeah. Likewise, we've dumped millions of uh, of, of uh, low-skill immigrants into the labor force uh, since yeah. the early 1970s, and that exaggerates the, uh, the income inequality picture. They're better off than they were in Mexico or Central America. We're better off, I would argue, uh, uh, to have access to this labor. Uh, some low-wage uh, native-born Americans may be worse off, uh, but overall I think it's win-win, and yet it shows up as a clear loss in terms of, of worsened inequality. So is it <clears throat> Once you sort through all of those things, to me, the, the thing that stands out clearest is something that really did happen, uh, yeah. is that the returns to high skills relative to the returns to low skills have increased. Uh, it seems to have happened, most of that seems to have happened in the 1980s, but basically the college premium uh, went up a lot. Uh, 
and the grad school premium went up even more. Uh, mm-hmm. And and so uh, that means that the, the benefits of having high human capital, of having uh, well, well-developed marketable skills uh, have, have gone up, and by the same token, the, the opportunity costs of, of an absence of human capital have, have gone up. And, and I think that is... That is a matter of legitimate social concern. How do we? Uh, my take on this would not be, uh, you know, how do we uh, punish the the winners? Uh, uh, nor would it be to to blur the or to interfere with the signals uh, that are telling us that uh, uh, human capital is uh, is at a premium these days. And uh, because if if we reduce the returns to high human capital, then what kind of signal is that that we're sending? We're telling people that they shouldn't develop the human capital. Right now, uh, given the big college premium, given the big skills premium, that's a huge incentive for people to go to college and develop uh, high skills, and that's, those, that's a good incentive structure. So the, the question is how can we uh, adjust social policy to lift people up, people who have low skills? Uh, how can we encourage them to develop them and, and take advantage of the, the massive opportunities that are available to, uh, to the high-skilled in, in this new economy? All right, to play, to play devil's advocate on this, though, Brink, I mean, one of the arguments that you know, people like Paul Krugman are making is that while there is an education premium, that's not the, the – you know, they, they, a lot of Democrats wind up saying, yes, there's an education, you know, premium. There's no question about that. This, uh, that's going on. But that's being – that's not the significant effect. The significant effect is when you look at the upper 1 percent or 0.1 percent or 0.01 percent of the population, and those are the ones who have truly been benefiting from the last couple decades. Which I think ties into their arguments. I mean, it, I haven't seen it explicitly, but I think a lot of these people are sort of asserting that it's a superstar economy. You know, that the idea that um, the way the economy functions now, there's certain people who are doing really well off because they win the lottery, and you know, there are certain jobs for which, you know, there can be only so many television anchors. There can only be so many, right. um, you know, superstars in a particular profession. And if you manage to get that superstar status, it's great, but otherwise, you know, there's much more insecurity. Yeah, I, I think some of that is going on, yeah. uh, but, uh, and, the, the, you know, the tournament economy, the winner-takes-all economy, that you can certainly tournament see economy, you, that's right, yes. You can certainly, you know, summon up anecdotes in your mind, no problem. Um, mm-hmm. The question is, how big a deal of that is that, and is it really driving uh, measured inequality? Uh, I, I think... What we do know is that the wage inequality or skill gap doesn't seem to drive a lot of the of the uh, of the measured income inequality numbers, at least not since the late 80s, because we've had a big right. con- continued increase in measured income inequality, but not a continued increase in the college the premium. Uh, so it looks like it's uh, it's what we call within group inequality uh, or residual inequality. Uh, that is, uh, uh, people who have the same skill set. That's continuing to go up. The between-group inequality has kind of flattened out since the late 1980s. But uh, that's where I think the, the numbers are shakiest. Uh, we, there was a, uh, an American Economic Review uh, piece by, I believe uh, the author's name is Lemieux, that came out over uh, the summer, I think. Uh, I'm sure we'll link to it uh, by the time this is posted. Yeah. Uh, but uh, he sorted through uh, uh, what's driving these numbers, and his conclusion was that it's compositional effects largely, that, that our uh, population is older today and better educated today, and older people have a wider spread of income uh, than younger people because they've had more time to sort themselves out into, into different career paths. Better, educa- better educated people have a, you know, a more dispersed uh, income distribution than less educated people because less educated people are all concentrated around a kind of uh, relatively low wages, whereas high educated people go from uh, gazillionaires to, uh, to think tank wage slaves like myself. Uh, so uh, so uh, once you control for the, the changing demographics of the population, a lot of this goes away. Uh, so... Uh, that's one point. How how much uh, that makes the the inequality trends of the 90s go away? I don't. I, I'm not entirely sure. Lemieux says it's the lion's share of it. Um, on top of that, the question is how relevant to public policy is uh, right. what the one percent is uh, the top one percent are doing compared to what the top ten percent are doing. I, I should mm-hmm. think it's of no concern whatsoever. Uh, mm-hmm. I think the 
the top 10% of Americans are uh, just the most extravagantly blessed cohort of human beings in history. Uh, and for, for the person sitting at the 90th percentile to be grousing about what Bill Gates is doing is just uh, uh, you know, unseemly bordering on, uh, on obscene. Uh, well, so, I this, so I don't this care how the top 1% are doing. I, I care how yeah. the top 10% are doing versus the, the 50 percentile and versus the 10th percentile. But I just I don't see any... I don't see any legitimate uh, interest other than just envy uh, in obsessing the top I mean, 1%. Th I, I think, and this is where things get occasionally a little shaky. I think the, arg the implicit argument that people, like Krugman in particular makes this, although I don't know he's got any evidence to back it up, is the belief that equality, that there's a correlation between equality and growth and, and social stability. I mean, I think Krugman, you know, constantly harkens back to the 50s because he believes that, be, that since, you know, the distribution of, of gains was somewhat more egalitarian then, and we had a higher growth rate, and we had more political stability, whereas he seems to feel that if there's more inequality, you know, if there's really stark inequality, if we start looking more like Brazil, that this will lead to political instability and, you know, riots and the whole mess of sort of social, uh, social dysfunction right. that we've experienced, you know, in the past, which... I'm not entirely sure I buy. Uh, empirically, I don't know if that holds for the United States. Um, and actually, I mean, there are arguments out there that, that say that uh, less, dynamic, less dynamic societies are actually more stable politically. I mean, this is the old Sam Huntington argument. Uh, right. That's not to say that I'm therefore advocating rising inequality and, and stasis in the United States. It's just that it, it's that last step, the, the one to political stability, that I, I think I question the most. Yeah, I uh, I don't think we're uh, turning into a Brazil. Uh, we, yeah. We've we've got if if the people who are doing very well, and that is let's just take uh, college educated as a surrogate for high skilled uh, or high human capital uh, people. Uh, you know, or even college educated professors for that. Yeah, yeah uh, uh, you know uh, the the percentage of college educated Americans now is at an all time high. The percentage right. of homeowners is at an all time high. Uh, we're, we're not. We don't have this tiny little elite that's doing great, and everybody else groaning in misery at the bottom. We have uh, since since the '80s boom began, uh, we've had uh, a big shift uh, of people out of the middle and and towards the right side of the bell curve on the income distribution. We've had a lot of people moving up the, into into uh, into higher real income, and and the middle category Facing has gotten a little bit smaller, tax. and the little yeah. and the poor categories have gotten a little bit smaller as well. So we. We've just gotten richer as a society, and some people have gotten, you know, crazily rich, and and uh, and I don't care. Uh, I, I I'm sure that uh, that our a whole host of, of institutional and policy and and just structural factors make it easier today for high performers to claim a larger share of the value they create. Uh, I think the the easiest to understand analogy is uh, is in sports. Uh, you look back right. to when we were kids, uh, football players made nothing, and uh, now they make a whole bunch because of free agency and because uh, they're able to really capture the economic value that they produce, or at least a higher fraction of it than they used to be able to, because teams have to compete for them. No. Uh, back in the old days, where you worked for the same company your whole life, there wasn't really a market for executive talent or high skilled talent like there is today. Not nearly as well developed a one. Now, pe now the people at the top are, are competed for by everybody, and so they are able to command a higher fraction of the value that they produce. Uh, so they get rich. Uh, that uh, that doesn't come at the expense of people in the middle of the wage ladder or at the bottom of the wage ladder. Uh, the different skill sets are different labor markets, and and uh, the those labor markets are going to work to match supply and demand uh, at, at at different levels. And so the fact that you're paying your executive a lot of money doesn't doesn't mean you're going to hire fewer uh, you know mid skill workers uh, right. if uh, if they if their marginal value is more than their marginal cost. So uh, I think it's uh, there's a really sort of simplistic zero-summism uh, that suggests that if the 1% hog everything, there's nothing left for the rest of us, and, and that, just, yeah. that just isn't how labor markets work. No, and worse, it would potentially, you know, create some moral hazard problem where, you know, potentially politically the notion that if there's rising inequality, therefore there should be greater redistribution, it creates the expectation potentially among those less well-off that says, well, if you see this, then we can guarantee that the state will, you know, appropriate, uh, you, know, the top, you know, more from the top 1% and will be better off as well. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to, to, you know, pursuing, 
pursuing their own individual strategies to try to improve their uh, their income stream. Right. Um, there's a there's a just one more point because the, the sure. There is at least theoretically plausible reason for concern about inequality, which is that the rich will just control the political process. Uh, right, and that's that. I mean, that is related, to be fair, to, to what the Democrats are saying. And I, yes, I, you know, I mean, it, this is actually one of the problems I've got with big government conservatism as well, which is it's it's caused me to sort of reappraise the notion of government privatization. You know, the idea that that. Um, this sort of in-between step where the government outsources functions to the private sector but still pays for them. You know, when it was initially proposed, I mean, a couple, you know, a long time ago, I thought, yeah, sure, this makes a great deal of sense. Ah, uh, hold on one second, Brent. Sure. We get to do this live, you know. Wait one second. Okay. Hello. Hi. I have to get off the phone because I'm right now talking to you in front of a blogging heads thing. I love you, too. Bye. Sorry about that. That was my wife. Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, the the, the I, I agree with you that uh, that government contractors aren't much of an improvement over uh, over government officials. Uh, we right, all remember, we all remember the eight hundred seat dollar toilet production. seats, and uh, and yeah. so that kind of privatization strikes me as as uh, as what what we need is competition in markets, not. Uh, that's more important than than whether someone's nominally in the private sector or not. Or nominally in the private, yeah. yeah. But, but uh, the the I think the the concern about political power falls a, apart on because of its premises that the rich are politically homogeneous and have homogeneous interests, and and they certainly don't. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I we see the rise of of you know of rich left wingers, uh, and there's uh, and and just generally. Uh, uh, High-income professional Democrats. There's lots of them, uh, and mm -hmm. and indeed in 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 some uh, uh, high-income professions, Democrats are, are you know dramatically outnumber Republicans. So, and we see these days uh, the traditional funding gap uh, between Republicans and and Democrats. That is the Someone's fund fund, yeah. fund raising ability is, is more or less closed. So. To me, the idea that, that money is weighing down on one side of the political equation doesn't really pan out, and therefore the fact that there's a lot more money than there used to be doesn't suggest that one side is going to get some kind of unfair advantage. Frank, I think you should, you, yeah, this, this is potentially the topic for your next book. You know, I think you can write this sort of sequel to What's the Matter with Kansas. You just call it What's the Matter with Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> um, yeah, it would work out well for you. Okay, I'll... Um, well, it should be pointed out, though, that you know the the, the sort of rise of economic populism and the concern about inequality is not is hardly unique to the United States. Um, Definitely you know, not. And that, and that this has become a global problem, uh, in some ways far worse, you know, elsewhere. I was taking a look uh, earlier in the week at uh, I'm going to mangle her name, Ségolène Royal, yes, uh, the the French uh, the left uh, candidate for presidency, and um, well, let's just say she's got an interesting economic platform. Um, no, you know, that include. It, yeah, go ahead. Oh no, that includes. You know, that includes among other things. You know, eliminating what minor reforms were taken in French labor markets to make it easier to hire and fire people. Um, you know, basically public goodies for everyone. Uh, um, you know, free contraception. Uh, I think what was it, ten thousand euros uh, for individuals just to spend as they please. Um, I'm trying to remember what the other aspects of the program were. Um, yeah, the, the minimum wage of, of two thousand dollars a oh, month. Oh yeah, uh, that's uh, that, that just that sounds like it's more than fifty percent above our minimum wage. Right, minimum wage. I think roughly of, of if I, you know translated, I think you know roughly twenty, you know maybe thirty thousand uh, yeah. dollars would be a minimum wage in, in France. Which you know, I'm sure and what, buys what, a lot of our minimum wage just moved up to what seven fifty or something like that. So, I believe so. I'm not sure if it's been decided yet. Yeah, but so, but that's what they're trying to move it to, and so 2,000 yeah. hours times eight would be 16,000 years. So you can see the huge disparity between what we're trying to do and what she's proposing. Right, um, and you know what, what bothers in a, in me in a country almost, with double-digit uh, unemployment and right. uh, and low labor force participation and abysmal labor force participation with the young and with immigrant populations that uh, she's just. Uh, uh, yeah, in full. Oh, she's better. She, to be fair, she is good on the immigration issue. She's much more. Uh, she's she's she hasn't been immigration immigration bashing, which is actually the depressing thing. I mean, you think you know proposing a, a program like that, you know, you can presumably talk about the right candidate as well. But Nicolas Sarkozy, 
um, you know, although potentially a little more uh, business friendly, also talks about balance. And he, he actually said at one point, I think he talked about balancing between protection and protectionism. As yes. if protectionism is a good thing that we should, you know, therefore draw some, uh, you know, trade protectionism is actually a good thing that we should draw some elements from. So, I mean, if that's your, your range of choices, I'm not sure how. Uh, I'm worried about France. No, no, France is France is uh, deeply in denial, uh, and uh, its uh, its Thatcherite moment is nowhere on the horizon. Let's put it that way. I mean, but this is not hardly this is hardly limited to France. This is a global problem. Yes. You know, the Chinese are acting in a more populist manner for Pete Six. And of course, we've seen this throughout South America, and yeah. uh, and so what we had in the in the eighties and nineties, uh, we had the real collapse in the developing world of the state-dominated economic model yeah. of the import substitution uh, economic model, uh, and. Uh, and a groping towards what was called the neoliberal model or the Washington Consensus. The Washington model. Consensus, right? Right. And uh, and for many many countries went through wrenching changes and uh, and actually did get a lot of things right that they had been getting wrong before. Uh, but nonetheless, the results were disappointing. It turns out uh, what what we had hoped naively, those of us on the free market side uh, in the in the 80s, uh, was that if you follow this sort of formula of one, two, three of, you know, macroeconomic stabilization, privatization, and opening your markets to foreign competition and investment, uh, that you would then, uh, you know, uh, be with better than even odds, find yourself on this glide path towards steady, sustainable economic development and find yourself rich in a generation or so. And, uh, and it hasn't worked out that way for many, many countries. It turns out that their problems were deeper and more profound and, and harder to fix uh, than we thought. Uh, and so a lot of uh, folks there have a bad taste in their mouths about free markets reforms because they went through a, a, lot, a number of them and they haven't panned out. And so it's very easy then for demagogues and populists and reactionaries to say uh, this whole pro-market approach was snake oil and we need to go back to the good old days of, uh, of uh, you know, whatever crazy nostrum they come up with. I mean, I guess, Mike, you know, there are two fears you have on this. The first is is that the problem with both sort of – both. The thing about liberal, political, you know, economic liberalization, and for that matter, economic retrenchment, is that they have sort of political knock-on effects that wind up reinforcing the original policy, unless there's an exogenous shock. So, yes. you know, if you have a push towards protection, that you therefore create protected industries in a whole number of countries that will not exist unless the protection is not just, you know, um, is not just maintained, but if anything, strengthened. Because regardless of government policy, there are technological innovations that make trade easier across the board. Um, and so as a result, you start seeing, you know, demands for even more protection, um, you know, once it's instilled. And so I think my, my concern is whether or not we're at one of those sort of tipping points. And I think, uh, you know, it's interesting, um, there's an article on foreign affairs uh, uh, in the January-February issue that Rawi Abdullal and Adam Siegel wrote about this question about whether or not globalization had passed its peak. Right. Um, and, you know, my fear is that they're right, that, that, or to some extent, which is the future right now is unclear, but it might be that we've sort of reached an inflection point. And it's going to be a long decade, let's say, or, you know, where we're just going to have to ride out people making stupid policies until we get back to the recognition that, gee, maybe free markets might actually be a good thing. Yeah, well, I, I wrote a book about this called uh, Against the Dead Against Hand. Against the Dead Hand, a great and, book, yes. And the idea was, uh, the premise of the book was that the kind of ideological faith in central planning and state control has, has died, and, and, uh, and its death was the cause of this current episode of globalization, this turn away from uh, the state and towards markets. Uh, but uh, the, for most countries, the turn didn't occur because of some sort of ideological uh, conversion to Adam Smith. It occurred purely out of pragmatism, that, that, right. that their countries had blown up and they needed to do something else, and the only thing left was, was turning towards markets. And so it was a total, totally pragmatist kind of, uh, of arrangement and, and, and you know, paper-thin commitment to, to market policies. No, not, no particular understanding uh, or deep understanding so that you could weather the storms or implement uh, reforms correctly. And so you have a lot of compromise and mess and, and uh, you know, form tri uh, triumphing over substance and half measures and all the rest. And, and so you get a two steps forward, one step back, or sometimes two steps forward, three steps back dynamic yeah. uh, where 
uh, countries reform during a crisis, and then when the crisis passes or or uh, the reforms don't work out very well, you get a reaction, and then and then that reactionary phase lasts a while, and then uh, and it ends badly, and so then uh, you uh, you ultimately uh, turn to reform again. My my argument is that the reason to be hopeful over the longer term is that unlike in the past, in the past we had a, a clear defined. Uh, model for anti-market forces. That was central planning. Uh, right. And now nobody believes that anymore. Uh, and so uh, and so, these days when you hit a crisis uh, and, and things have fallen apart, uh, I don't think you can turn to the socialist model as you could in the past with, with anywhere yeah. near the credibility that you used to be able to. So it seems to me that you're going to have uh, countries falling off the wagon and, and, and doing bad things and, and reaping bitter consequences. But So your but argument the, is that even if countries fall off the wagon, they won't fall as far, and it's easier for them to get back on the wagon if they're, you know, if the, the sort of uh, regis policies don't work out terribly well. Yeah, the, I think the big exception is, is countries that have natural resource wealth uh, because yeah. uh, they can just, you know, pump their tax revenues out of the ground uh, or right. dig them out of the ground. And so uh, that's, you know, the... So in South America, Venezuela, I think, is you know, unreformable for quite a while. And as many uh, populist uh, anti-market regimes as Hugo Chavez can prop up with foreign aid, uh, those will last a while. Uh, but but by, by and large, my hope uh, is that we have something of a ratchet effect where it's, uh, it's harder to go back than it is to go forward. Hmm. But, but that, doesn't, that, that doesn't mean uh, that... Uh, that we're not going to have uh, periods of backsliding. And I think we had a huge, uh, just, you know, a, a revolutionary change in global political economy, uh, uh, starting with the, the, you know, the debt crisis of 82, or go back a right. few years from that, you know, the, starting with Deng Xiaoping's reforms in China in 78, going through, uh, I don't know, the Asian crisis. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so that... That's a big change, and that takes some while to, to, to digest and then be ready to move on. Uh, but so right now we may be in a retrenchment phase. My hope is that uh, is that uh, you know that good news will follow. My hope so is too, because the last thing you want is a retrenchment phase at the same time that you've got a rising power potentially threatening um, you know the global hegemon, which is the the one concern I have about. Uh, if you have a retrenchment, what you know, what uh, Sino-American relations are going to start looking like sure. um, down the road? But I, I guess the, the question I would put to you now is whether or not you think the current backsliding is going to wind up deep sixing the Doha round. Well, the world trade talks. Yeah, I, uh, I think the, I think the Doha round is in very deep trouble, and no. and I don't have high hopes for its successful conclusion. Even if it is concluded, uh, my guess is that it. It won't be much of a success. Uh, the Doha round is a is a strange uh, answer to the question: uh, you know, how far can you push liberalization, uh, trade liberalization, purely uh, on the on the strength of a guilty conscience? Uh, and, <laughs> and 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 the, and the the answer is not very. So so what happened? Uh, you know, we had uh, we tried first. We weren't even going to have a new round after the Uruguay round. That was the big, the last big round that created the WTO. Right. It, it ended in '94, and after, and it had gone on for many years. And after that, people said, "Never again. We can't do this. It's too bulky. It's too, uh, it's too ungainly and cumbersome." Uh, but, but we had built in to the Uruguay round agreements, sort of built in negotiations on agriculture and services uh, to start in 2000, I believe. Uh, and so once those built-in negotiations were gearing up, people were thinking, well, good grief, since we're going to do these, we might as well have a, an omnibus round anyway so that we can have cross-sector deals and make the hard uh, choices yeah. on agriculture with deal sweeteners in other sectors. And so uh, <clears throat> the momentum geared up to try to launch a, multi, uh, a big omnibus round, uh, and then that fell apart in Seattle. Uh, and then people felt really guilty about uh, having the World Trade System blow up in Seattle, uh, and so, and then 9/11 uh, happened, and and then and then uh, the then the Doha ministerial meeting, which launched the Doha round, occurred six weeks after 9/11. So people were really feeling a guilty conscience about uh, about letting the World Trade System uh, blow up, and so uh, they were good boys and girls, and they got the round started. Uh, and after that, they did absolutely nothing until the Cancun ministerial conference, where it blew up again. 
Uh, and then people felt bad about that, and they patched things together uh, and, and got the round looking like it was moving forward. But it didn't move forward at all. And when they got to Hong Kong uh, uh, with the next ministerial conference, uh, it, it, there was no progress, and they couldn't make things work. And, and so I, I'm afraid we're in a situation right now where none of the major trading powers, the United States, Europe, Japan, and the larger exporting developing countries, none of them has a, uh, any particular – Yen for uh, trade liberalization. None of them, even on a mercantilist basis, uh, they're they're more right. interested in their defensive protectionist interests than they are in the possible gains they could get from better market access abroad. Uh, yeah. The Europeans, the Americans, and the Japanese are all, to a greater or lesser degree, worried about cosseting their uh, their farm lobby. Uh, the developing countries all think they gave it the office during the Uruguay round, and they think they ought to get liberalization without any further commitments now. And so there just really hasn't been uh, the kind of uh, space for for win win deals, uh, and uh, and so my my sense is that that if we can ever get this Doha round completed, and I'm not sure we will because the fast track that, that you need to have to to make it work here in the United States is about to expire, and I'm not sure it will be renewed anytime soon. Anyway, even if it is uh, 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 concluded, I think it will be a pretty penny any deal, uh, and yeah. so we'll we'll have had a. Uh, you know, uh, a, a whole lot of work and a whole lot of uh, uh, grunting and groaning with, without a lot to show for it. Well, I mean, unfortunately, this is one of these aspects about globalization that I talk about, which is uh, I talk about in my book, which is going to be coming out over the uh, next month called Very All good. Politics is Global, um, that basically argues that, ironically, it's the least globalized elements of society that wind up dictating what, uh, you know, what the great powers want to do, what their policies are going to be, about a whole range of issues. Um, and so, again, what you're seeing right now is the power of farm lobbies um, in both the U.S. and the EU helping to, you know, make it incredibly difficult uh, to liberalize even further. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, I think it's bad for the world. Good for my book, though. Yes. Um, all right. Unfortunately, I've uh, got to get going, so I think we need to, to wrap this up. But uh, I hope you enjoyed your first blogging heads experience. Absolutely. Excellent. And uh, we'll have to make sure you do this again. Very good. See you. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.